Thank you so much for choosing to spend some time with us. Our hope is that every message here at Life Church allows you to get to know the real Jesus even more than you did before. We hope you'll be able to join us at one of our many campuses or online every single week. Just jump on livelife.church to find the campus nearest you. If this message has impacted you, we encourage you to click on the Give tab and partner with us through giving and seeing what God can do through Life Church. Amen. So we are in our series uh, with the River Community Church entitled Better Together. And uh, we've, we've had a lot of fun, but I'm excited to be in this series with them. And this weekend, both churches are talking about spiritual warfare, spiritual warfare. We're going to look at four keys today that will help us win this spiritual war we're in. And number one, the first key, and most of these, all of these, all four of these are something that when you first hear it, you'd be like, oh, hello, and I knew that. You know what? Sometimes we can know stuff and still not really be paying attention to it. So, number one, the first key is don't ignore the war. Don't ignore the war. Duh, Pastor Bob. Listen, so many people in the church, and I've done it myself, so I'm not pointing the finger, but we can forget we're at war. We We can so get caught up in this physical world of working and shopping and raising our kids and building our homes and all those things are great and fine, but we're in a war and we cannot ignore this war because I'm going to tell you one individual that does not ignore the war and that's the devil. He's very, very serious about this war you and I are in. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 3. 2 Corinthians 10, 3, for though we walk in the flesh, that means live in this physical realm, if you will, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. And at the end of this message, we're going to talk about these strongholds and what they are. But he says, we don't war according to the flesh. He didn't say we don't war. He just thinks that it's understood we're at war, but he said, here's what he's saying. It's not a physical war. It's not a war that you can actually even see. Notice this. In Luke 13, uh, 19, 13, we're not going to turn over there. But in Luke 19, 13, Jesus talking about our mission, if you will, on earth. He's talking about the church. He uses a military term. And the military term Jesus uses, he says, occupy till I come. Occupy till I come. That's a military term. Expression. Matter of fact, the word occupy, here's what it means, to obtain and maintain possession. You've heard this phrase, or you've read this when you've re- read a history book on war, but it, the phrase is, they occupied enemy territory. What's that mean? They went in and took over, if you will. Jesus is telling you and I, occupy till I come. What he's saying is, don't get so preoccupied, you no longer occupy. And, and, and that's happened some. This is, not a, this is a positive message, not a negative message. But if we're going to have positive outcomes, we're going to have to look at some of these keys. So 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 4. Notice this. Paul talking to Timothy, he says, No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that it may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Here's what he's saying. Hey, Timothy, you're in a war. And no soldier that is engaged in war, entangles himself or gets too distracted as a soldier. He's saying, Timothy, don't get so preoccupied you forget to occupy. Just for example, you would never see two soldiers who are at battle and bullets are flying stop, lay their guns down and say, you want to play chess? You want to play checkers? Why? Because they know they're at war. This ain't time for games. Now listen, we should enjoy the earth. We should enjoy our family, enjoy vacations. Some of you are enjoying the lake right now. Bless you. But listen, but at the same time, we got to understand, the devil knows this is not all games and fun. This is war. Don't ignore the war. Number two, we must back our allies, not attack our allies. What does that mean? Folks, we must not forget who our enemy is and who our allies are. What do you mean? We got to understand something. Our allies are other churches. Well, that's just understood. No, you wouldn't believe how much that's misunderstood. Our allies are other churches. That's why I love that we are teaming up with the River Church for this series. And we team up with them and other churches quite a bit. 
quite a bit. Other outreaches and missions projects. Why? Because they're our ally. Matter of fact, let me just let you in on something. We help other churches all the time. Why? Because we know this is not all about us. The, 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 the buses that we have bought, and thank you, by the way, for giving. That, that allows us to, to pick up kids from school on Wednesday and bring them to our youth groups. Kids that would not be able to come because their parents don't go to church. Our buses goes and picks them up. We take our kids to camps. We take our senior saints to, to, to trips and, and, and things like that. Why? Because of, of coming together and we're better together. But you wouldn't believe how many times we loan those buses out to other churches. Churches will call and say, we need to take our youth to the airport in Atlanta to go on a missions trip and we don't have a bus. Absolutely, your, our bus is your bus. Or, or our buildings, we allow other churches to use our bus. Why? Because this is not about us, we're team church. So we gotta back our allies, not attack our allies. I really believe it's one of the reasons we've grown because I think God blesses that. I absolutely do. Uh, people talk about this a lot. Bible studies are on this, and you've asked it, and I've asked it. But why was the early church in the book of Acts so powerful? You can't read the Bible without seeing that. You can't, I mean, you can't really read the Bible, Acts 1, Acts 2, Acts 3, Acts 4, Acts 5, and not see. There was explosive, explosive miracles happening. Well, let me ask you something. What happened? What, what happened? I mean, the Bible says God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday and forever. So, so what's missing? Is there some miracles missing? And if the miracles are missing, then what's missing? Is our God missing? No, here it is. The secret to their power, go read it, was their unity. It was their unity, folks. They were one place, one accord, one mind, one heart, all through there. Just go underline how many times it says, and they were one place and one accord, and they had all things in common. Nobody said with things, it was no private agendas. And then 50, 60 years later, Paul's writing to the church going, why is there so many divisions among you? Can I tell you who's behind that? The devil himself. United we, divided we. That doesn't just go for our nation, that goes for the church. God blesses unity, and Satan works hard on division. He works hard on it. Why? Because he knows if he can divide us, he can destroy us. He understands the power of unity. Let me read you one of the last prayers of your master and my master, Jesus Christ. This is just a few days before Jesus goes to the cross. Now, we know the prayer of Gethsemane, Lord, if there be any way, take this cup from me. But we only find him pray that one time right before he goes to the cross. But this is not very long before he goes to the cross. And I want you to see what his heart's praying. I don't know about you, but I'd still be praying Gethsemane. You know what I'm saying? Father, I don't want railroad spikes through my hands and my feet. I don't want them to beat me unrecognizably. I, I don't want to be separated from you. I mean, I would be praying like, I mean, Peter's a jerk. Why wouldn't you do, use him to do this? <laughs> You know, you would be selfish in this prayer too if they were fixing to beat you unrecognizable and crucify you. But I want you to hear what our master is praying. You, we want him to listen to our prayers. Well, let's listen to his. And here it is. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. For those people that love me, September in 2019, I'm praying for them too, Father. What are you praying, Jesus? I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you, may they be one in us so that. I'm praying for their unity for a purpose, Father. What? So that the world will believe that you sent me. He didn't say, Father, I'm praying that they'll be able to raise more people from the dead. I'm praying that they'll be able to open blind eyes. I'm praying that they'll be able to do, are those things great? Yeah, he's not praying for any of that. He said, I'm praying that they'll get along with each other, that they'll drop their indifference so they can make a difference. I'm praying because when the church really becomes one, really, really loves each other the way you and I, Father, love each other, the world will then believe that you sent me. You know why he wasn't praying for, for raising up the dead or opening blind eyes? Because that's easy stuff for God. You know what's hard for him? us getting along with each other. Look how he had to deal with his disciples. They were always fighting. 
God loves it when his children get along with each other, don't you, parents? They can run a car ride, can't they? <laughs> the little kid wants what the big kid's got, and you finally turn around and say, just give it to her. My gosh. <laughs> you just want your, you want peace. You want your kids to love each other and get along. So does the father. So does the father. See? We want Jesus to answer our prayers. But how about we be the answer to his? Because I believe if we'll focus on being the answer to his prayer, he may be more inclined to answer ours. What's he praying? Father, that they may be one. I say little phrases sometimes, not to just be cute. I want them to stick in your mind. That's why I say phrases and rhymes and stuff like that. So I got one for you today. Here it is. I want this to stick in your heart and your mind. When the church is unified, Satan is terrified and Jesus is glorified. Let that tattoo that on your heart. When the church is unified, Satan is terrified and Jesus is glorified. And Jesus is saying, Lord, I want them to have the glory that you and I have. May they be one. You see, let me just share something with you. And, and this is not about attacking, but this is about just talking about how Satan works so hard at this. So recently, one of our staff, and we promote this, we encourage this, but one of our staff was helping another church recently. Didn't charge me, they just went to help them. And what the pastor didn't realize is that one of my staff members could hear him and he started kind of bashing and attacking Life Church. Here's the point. That used to make me mad, now it just makes me sad. Sad for him, sad for the kingdom. Why? Because Satan's behind that. Satan's behind that. See, here's what I want these pastors to know. When you compete, you deplete your own vision. And division takes more energy than vision. For example, I have people come ask me sometimes. I've had other pastors ask me. What do you think about Joel Osteen? What do you think about John Hagee? What do you think about so-and-so? And And you know what my my true answer is? I don't. If I'm always thinking about them, I can't think about what God wants me to do. I mean, you know what I'm saying? And can I tell you something? They sure ain't thinking about me. They don't even know I exist. But you think about it. If I'm always focused on what they're doing, then I can't focus on what God wants us to do. Hello, and and by the way, I don't agree with all of them. I don't even agree with sometimes what I say. (laughs) I said, what? But my point is, Satan's behind this division. And by the way, other preachers, they're not my servants, they're God's servant. If he's got a problem with them, he'll thump them on the head. I say it all the time. I got enough weeds in my garden to be hoeing yours. Hello, some of you country boys understand what I'm saying. You city folks are like, what does that mean? Well, (laughs) find a redneck and he'll tell you. Anyway, (laughs) see, I constantly remind other pastors and myself when I go and minister to other churches, one of the main things I talk to them about is unity because God blesses that. God loves and craves unity. And I remind them, Church is not golf. It's baseball. Let me explain what I mean by that. So I was doing college ministry years ago. (laughs) Like when Moby Dick was a minnow. I was, as they say, when the Dead Sea was just sick. (laughs) And so I was doing college ministry, and several of the Tennessee Tech baseball players came to our ministry, our college ministry. So I would go when I had an opportunity and watch them play baseball. And one day I went, and I'm going to tell you something. Tech was getting killed. There was this pitcher, man, and nobody could hit off this boy. I mean, he had struck everybody out. And I remember this one young man. I still remember his name, Matt Curtis. And here's why I remember this game and this young man. Because it brought into my mind, I felt like the Holy Spirit said, this is what the church is. And I watched Matt Curtis walk up. And I don't know if it was the first or second pitch, but he crushed one over center field crushed it. Do you know all those Tennessee Tech baseball players that struck out, they didn't say, jerk. 
Can't believe he hit off of me. You know what they did? They all ran out to home plate, and they put their hands up and gave him a high Why? Because when he scored, they scored. If the river has an outreach and 500 people get saved, we just scored. The kingdom just grew. I mean, I don't know why we can't get that. We want to be a church that looks at the scoreboard, not our own scorecard. Number three, refrain from relationships with those unwilling to train for war. I'm going to explain what this one means. Refrain from relationships with those unwilling to train for war. What do I mean? This is not about being better than somebody. It's not about that. We are an evangelistic church. What do I mean by that? We truly believe that the Bible means what it says when it says, whosoever will shall come. This is a hospital. Messed up people are welcome here. You're welcome. What do I mean? You're welcome for us allowing messed up people here because you're messed up. Right? So am I. So, but here's my point. Here's my point. So we are evangelistic. But, but, we need to be inclusive when it comes to others' salvation, but exclusive when it comes to our personal transformation. What do I mean? You can't just hang out with anybody. We tell our kids that. We tell our kids, don't hang around a bad crowd. We, we quote this scripture, bad company corrupts good morals. That goes for you too and me too. What do I mean? If your marriage is on the rocks right now and you don't know it's going to survive, don't hang out with a couple that's as bad or worse off than you are. I mean, how dumb can you get and still breathe? Right? We hate each other. We do too. You want to go eat? <laughs> no! That's understood. It's not understood. Hello? Listen, if you're battling drug addiction right now, probably don't hang around with a crack addict. Right? So what I'm saying is refrain from relationships with those unwilling to train for war. We're not, we don't have to all be on the same plane, but we all do need to train. Does that make sense? Protect your circle. Protect your circle. What do I mean? You need people in your life, if you're going through a bad marriage, find a godly marriage and hang out with them. Tell them, we will pay for y'all's dinner if you'll just go have dinner with us. Why? Because you're wanting to get better. It's kind of like golf. They tell me. I joined the PGA Tour, Pathetic Golfers Association. <laughs> you don't want to play golf with me. I will bring you down to my level. You play with me, you'll be like, I've never hooked a golf ball before. You're welcome. <laughs> You just do it like this. See, it'll hook. You'll slice. You'll pe hit people in the head. I'm serious. I've knocked people out on the golf course. They've got a picture of me at the clubhouse. Watch for this guy. But they tell me, if you want to get better at golf, you play with somebody that's better at golf than you. That's the truth. If you want to get better at God, hang around with people that's better at God than you. Protect your circle. Listen, nobody was better at God than Jesus. He was God. But he had a circle. Yeah, he had thousands that was around him. Then he had 70 that kind of traveled with him. But he had 12 that his inner circle. And out of them 12, he had three. Who's your three? Who's somebody that helps you be better at war? So we need to refrain from those who are not willing to train for the war. Number four. Do not embrace the tragedy of a wrong strategy. We'll end with this one. Do not embrace the tragedy of a wrong strategy. What do I mean? We must be in the right fight. Notice this, Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 10. To end my letter, I tell you, be strong in the Lord and his great power. Wear the full armor of God. Wear God's armor says you can fight against the devil's clever tricks. Notice this now. Our fight is not against people on earth. Let me read that again. Our fight is not against people on earth. Let me read it again. Our fight is not against people on earth. Why do you keep doing that? Because the church has forgotten that. Our fight is not against people. This is not a ground war. Notice this. We are fighting against rulers, authorities, and powers of this world's darkness. We are fighting against the spiritual powers of evil 
in the heavenly. This ain't a ground war. Our fight's not with other people. See, not only is other churches not our enemy, lost people are not our enemy. Oh, we know that, Pastor. No, you wouldn't believe how many Christians don't know that. Let me tell you what helped me bring people to Jesus when I was working in the factory. I mean, I started winning people to Jesus way before I ever came, came into ministry. Why? Because I knew that was my responsibility. God said, now you're coming to heaven, take people with you, period. But you know what? Here's what helped me a lot. Get hold of this. I didn't expect lost people to act saved. There's a lot of Christians that do. Well, I get around them, they cuss, that offends me. Grow up, sissy. Listen, I, I'm not, I don't want to be around the, the guy in the plant that, that cusses the most either. But listen, lost people are going to act lost. Matter of fact, as I've been doing this job, I've had to lower my standards on save people a little bit. <laughs> Hello? Our fight is not against people on this earth. I'm not saying try to find the roughest crowd to get around. Yes, we've got to protect our circle. But listen, our fight is not with flesh and blood. This is not a ground war. Notice this, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. Let me tell you why, let me show you why lost people act lost. Here's why lost people act lost. Here it is. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They're blind. Notice this. They are, everybody say unable. unable. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of God who is in the exact likeness of of God. Why does lost people act lost? Why do they say words you would not say? Why do they do things that you would not do? Because they're blind. And so, church, here's the point. Take someone who's physically blind, and they show up to the restaurants you're trying to eat in, and they don't have anybody to help them, and they don't have a cane, and, and, and actually they're stumbling through the restaurant, bumping into people's tables. What kind of person would you be if you'd be like, look at him? can't even make it through this place without bumping into everything. Why is he even here? No, what you should do as somebody that loves Jesus, run over to him and say, let me help you find your table. That's what we're supposed to be doing with lost people. That's what we're supposed to be doing with lost people. Instead of going, look at him and how he's stumbling. 1 Peter 5, 8, this is your enemy. Stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, your enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So our enemy is not people. Our enemy is the devil. But now I'm going to show you his weapons, and we'll go home. This is his weapons. 2 Corinthians 10, 3. For though we walk or live in the flesh, this physical body, we are not carrying on warfare according to the flesh. We use mere human weapons. The weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood, but they are mighty before God for the overflow and destruction of strongholds. There's that word, strongholds. Here it is. What are strongholds? Inasmuch as we refute arguments, theories, and reasoning, and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God, and we lead every thought and purpose way in captivity to the obedience of Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. Here's what he's saying. Our war is not with people on the ground, flesh and blood, but it's against these evil rulers in heavenly places. And then he says, and the weapons are Reasonings, theories, and every proud and lofty ideology that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. What does that look like? Well, let me just give you one, the evolution theory. That's a theory. You know why it's still called a theory all these years later? Because they can't prove it. You know why they can't prove it? Because it's a lie. It's a lie. My point is, you talk to some of the scientists at Tennessee Tech, I have, because I did college ministry for years. They prove it's this true every year. But, but you may say, well, you know, we know that God just did. Yeah, but our kids are facing this kind of stuff all the time. It's theories, it's reasonings, it's lofty ideas that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Listen to this one, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. For the world is unprincipled. It's dog eat dog out there. The world doesn't fight fair, but we don't live or fight our battles that way. We never have and never will. The tools of our trade aren't for marketing or manipulation, but they are for demolishing that entirely massive corrupt culture. Not talking about people, it's talking about this culture of reasoning. Now notice this. We use our powerful God tools for smashing warped people. 
warped philosophies. Tearing down barriers erected against the truth of God, fitting every loose thought and emotion and impulse into the structure of a life shaped by Christ. See, here's what's happened. The God of this world has blinded the minds of those who don't believe, and he's blinded them through these ideologies and theories and reasonings and warped philosophies, and they're kind of like under his spell. And we're going to talk about how to bring down these strongholds, but you've heard the, the phrase, the ties that bind? Satan uses the lies that bind. The lies that bind. They bind people up. And I'm going to tell you something. I truly believe, I've said this the last few months, but I believe it with all my heart. Satan knows his time is short. I believe it's closer than we can even imagine. I really do. And he knows his time. And so he's on an all-out assault. And let me tell you one way that he's really sped up this ideology or two ways, really, this, and these false reasonings that sets themselves up against the knowledge of God. First one is the Internet and social media. Now, listen to me. There's some good stuff on there. We'll be using it to go all over the world, other countries today. There is some good things and God things about the World Wide Web, but there is so much junk on there. And here's the bottom line. Our kids, from the time they get up, it's coming in. Shoo, 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 shoo. And a lot of what's coming in is totally against what you and I believe about this Bible. And so all this information infiltration is causing an indoctrination of these reasonings and ideologies that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Are you with me? It's an all-out assault. Now, Daniel, it gives us a great example of how to fight this war that we're in. Let me tell you why I use Daniel. Daniel was a man who faced the same thing that our youth face today. Daniel was a teenager. He loved God. But he's caught up in a place, he's living in a place called Babylon. Kind of reminds you of my preaching, doesn't it? I just babble on. <laughs> Different one. But he's in Babylon. Babylon is a very anti-God, corrupt culture. Matter of fact, they wanted the, the young people to worship false gods. And so... Daniel finds himself in this arena, if you will, in this culture. And notice this in Daniel chapter 1, verse 3. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to, to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble, fam noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men. <laughs> Not me. He said, make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning and gifted with knowledge and good judgment and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Now, here, listen to what the king says about these young people. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. The message translation, the king says, indoctrinate them in the Babylonian language. That's what is happening all across our nation in universities today. We can't lie about this, or, or not lie, but ignore this. Our universities today, many of them, listen, we've got great professors at Tennessee Tech. Some are my friends. We've got great professors. But by the most part, watch the news. If you're a God-fearing, Bible-believing, they will sometimes throw you off the campus now. Because they're no longer into education, it's indoctrination. They don't want to just teach calculus anymore. They don't want to just teach sociology. They want to talk to your young people about marriage and the value of marriage, and the definition of marriage, and, and, and is life, is all life valuable, and when does life begin? That ain't what they're there to teach, but that's what they're doing. And now you know why the statistics are, I read them for you, the statistics are today that young people who grow up, listen, in church, not outside of church, in church, our kids back there in kids' church right now and at other campuses, 80% of them, listen to this, 80%, if they go to a secular university, walk away from their faith never to return. Why? Indoctrination. These professors that's got all these degrees start telling them, well, I know what your mom and daddy said, but have you seen my degrees? Seriously, they get intimidated. And then they start sounding more smart than me and you. You know, Bobby from Bangham, what's he know? I mean, have you seen my degrees? Well, the thermometer's got degrees, and you know where they put some of them. So, <laughs> anyway, 
<laughs> Stop. <laughs> Don't hag me on. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. They're indoctrinating them. And most of this is not scientifically proved. They're on a mission. They're on a mission to rob your kid's faith. We can't ignore the war. Now listen, again, our fight is not with professors or flesh and blood. So what does Daniel do? He shows us how to fight this battle. So Daniel refuses to bow, refuses to go along. And so what happens? The king throws him into the lion's den. Do you understand we sometimes miss the whole point of that story? We teach our kids. So Daniel is a young man, and he's not willing to worship the statue, and so he's not going to give in to the Babylonian culture. And so the king, this bad man, throws Daniel in the lion's den, and all of a sudden God comes in and turns those lions into kitty cats, and Daniel pets them till the king shows up and lets him out. That's a great story, isn't it? And we talk about the, the salvation of Daniel, but that's not the main point of the story. The main point of the story is the salvation of an entire nation because one teenager didn't bow. That's why. The whole nation comes to God. The king says, because of Daniel's God, everyone in my, this nation shall fear and bow before the God of Daniel. That's why we go after these young people. They can change the world by just not compromising. But Daniel shows us. Let me finish this. Let's land this thing. Daniel demonstrates how to avoid the tragedy of a wrong strategy. He understood he was not in a ground war. It was a war of the air. Notice this. Daniel 6 verse 10. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, which means everybody in Babylon is going to bow to this statue, he went home, knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with his windows open toward heaven. He, everybody say prayed. He prayed three times a day, just as he's always done, giving thanks to his God. Then the officials went together to Daniel's house and found him praying and asking for God's help. Now, I'm going to say something, and I don't, I don't want anybody to take this wrong. Some people may take it wrong. Usually that's what happens. But I really mean this. Daniel didn't embrace the tragedy of a wrong strategy. It did not say Daniel protested and picketed three times a day. He prayed three times a day. I've never seen that work. It just makes people matter. Are you listening to me? You can't show me one time where a protest or a picket line worked. If you feel like God's called you to do that, go pick it. But Daniel realized, I can't change these people. I can't even change myself. But I know a God in heaven, if I pray to him, he'll not only change me, but he'll change them. That's how we win this war. We're not in a ground war. This is not a ground war. This is a war of the air. See, many Christians have the wrong strategy because they think they're fighting a ground war. Daniel knew his enemy was in the air and he knew his artillery was prayer. And any soldier would tell you the importance of air support. I had a friend in Bible school and he was a few years, several years older than me, by the way. And we also worked at a church together on the facilities. We'd go to Bible school during the day and clean this church at night. And I had earned his trust. We'd become friends. And all of a sudden, one night, I felt like it was a God moment. But he started sharing his heart with me. And he was a Vietnam War vet. And by the way, we love our veterans here. The price that was paid. But he knew I loved him and appreciated him. But he started just opening his heart up and he said, you know, when I came back from Vietnam, my own parents wouldn't speak to me till the day they died because they didn't agree with me going to war. Well, first of all, he didn't choose. He was drafted. But anyway, just went through some real rejection when he got back. But then he started telling me about this one fight they were in. He was a sergeant. And he said, we were supposed to take this bridge. And when we started coming in, we were ambushed and they just started killing my men. I mean, men around me were just dying. And he said, I had to call in artillery, air support. And he said, here comes these gunships, these 50 cal guns. And he said, they started just leveling. And he said, I had to call them in so close that it was like an earthquake. You couldn't even stand up because it was shaking. These ships are powerful. And he said, it looked like when they got the, they, the airships, the air support saved the rest of the men. But he said it looked like that that place had been logged where they came in with them gunships. And he said, man, 
I thank God for air support. Do you understand you have air support? I have air support. Let me show you. Let me show you Daniel 10, verse 12. Then he said, don't be afraid, Daniel. This is an angel that's come to Daniel. Don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you begin to pray for understanding and humble yourself before God, your request has been heard in heaven. I have come in answer to your prayer, but... For 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. Notice this. He said, Daniel, I was on my way the first day you began to pray. That's why you never stop praying. He said, I had to fight these, remember, rulers of the air? They are fallen angels. He said, I was fighting to get to you, but I had to fight these principalities and powers, but I was on my way the first day you began to pray. Sometimes we just quit because we don't understand what's going on up here. There's angels among us, and they're fighting on our behalf. But we've got to engage in prayer. We've got to call in air support. Notice this. Then Michael, one of the archangels, came to help me, and I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. In Daniel 10, 19. Then the one who looked like a man touched me again, and I felt strength returning. Don't be afraid, he said, for you are precious to God. Peace, be encouraged, be strong. As he spoke these words, I suddenly felt stronger and said to him, please speak to me, my Lord, for you have strengthened me. He called in air support. Notice this. He replied, do you know why I've come? Soon I must return and fight against the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. So I got to fight against this fallen angel. And after that, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Greece will come. Meanwhile, I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one helps me fight against these spirit princes, against these angels that are attacking you, except Michael. Notice this. Your Spirit Prince, you've got angels that want to fight on your behalf. But you got to call in their support. What does that mean? we got to pray. And sometimes we stop praying because we can't see what's going on. It's real even if you can't see it. Listen, we're not in a ground war. And prayer is how we bring in air support. It reminds me of Peter. Peter finds himself in prison. The Bible says he's in prison And not only he's in prison, he's chained between two soldiers. And in that same chapter, it says, and the church began to pray for Peter continuously. So we got the church praying. And all of a sudden, this angel shows up in Peter's prison and touches him on the side and says, follow me. And Peter follows him. His chains fall off. And guess what? He goes to the house that's praying for him. And these people remind me of me and you. They're praying for for Peter to get free, right? And when Peter knocks on the door, they shut the door because they can't believe it's Peter. (laughs) He's in prison. What's he doing here? Here's what he's doing there. Listen, the angel fetched Peter, but the prayer fetched the angel. Are you engaging the angelic host above us? We are not in the ground war. And we can win this war, but we got to engage. God has given us, I truly believe, four keys that will help us win the war we're in. There's more than these, but I want to get you out of here. But number one, don't ignore the war. There is a devil who is very serious about this war. That's why the Bible says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion seeking me to devour. Let me stop here a minute. I read that one day in my devotion. I read that. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion seeking me. And I read that one day. I felt like the Holy Spirit said this to me. I don't want my people to allow Satan to be more serious about their soul than they are. Be sober. Be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, is real serious about this war. He's serious about your marriage. He's serious about your kids. He's serious about your depression. He's ser- the devil's real serious. So get serious about this war. Don't ignore the war. Number two, we must back our allies, not attack our allies. We are better Together. Truly better together. Number three, refrain from close close relationships with those who do not train for war. Doesn't mean you're better than. It just means I need people in my inner circle that know how to fight. Know how to fight for my marriage. How to fight for my kids. And then number four, don't embrace the tragedy of a wrong strategy. This is not a ground war. This is a war in the heavenlies. And we win. All we got to do is just call on God. Amen? Stand up with me, please. Stand up with me.